Sandy Adams. This is the Rental Housing Network Show. Rental Housing Network is a member-based information center that provides rental owners and managers with the resources they need to be better informed landlords, such as forms, credit reports, operational advice, classes, and events. For a list of the benefits, visit our website at rentalhousingnetwork.com. Today, my guest is Dr. Dana Gerard, licensed clinical psychologist in private practice who specializes in the treatment of a hoarding disorder or hoarding disorders. Thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. Okay, so we're going to talk about the hoarding disorder. This is not just, you know, people cluttering or being sloppy. I mean, this is an actual disorder that people have, right? Yes, it is. Um, It is a disorder that is thought to affect about 6% of the population, which is considered even an underestimation of the disorder. For example, given that statistic in San Mateo County alone, uh, it's thought to exist among 36,000 residents. It's probably hard to measure, it, the percentage. It, it is because it's such a shaming disorder. Many people who struggle with this, the disorder will often say that and fear, which keeps them isolated. So that's another reason why the percentage is so low. I'm sure that someone with this disorder doesn't invite a lot of people to their home. I mean, they keep pretty much to themselves as far as when they're, when they're home or within their own apartment or house. Mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. Yeah. Very, very much. If someone suggests, hey, let's have coffee over at your house, the person who's struggling with clutter would probably distract the person from coming over, make up some excuse, suggest they meet at another coffee house instead of in the home. So there is a real distinctive difference, though, between hoarding and cluttering, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So can you explain the differences between the two? Sure. So Cluttering is something that millions of people struggle with. I mean, we all have that junk drawer with the chopsticks from the last Asian meal that we had or the ketchup packets from some fast food place or the the rubber bands, the twist ties, the recipes that we swear we will cook one day. Um, Those shoes in the back of the closet that you haven't seen for years or that, that car in the garage that you swear you'll fix one day. And if someone were to come over and you need to get something out of the way, you could throw a sheet over it, push it out of the way, and still invite the person over. But someone who struggles with hoarding has difficulty knowing what goes where. So clutter is greater than what one person can deal with. And just throwing a sheet over something isn't going to really make the clutter disappear. And the difference also between cluttering and hoarding is that hoarding often is what's called a comorbid disorder, which means that there is another disorder lying underneath fueling the behavior. Okay, so there's actually something else going on Mm -hmm. that creates or causes them to get all this stuff or leave all this stuff in their homes and not have the ability to get rid of it, Mm -hmm. right? Definitely. 70% of those that struggle with a hoarding disorder also struggle with what's called a mood disorder, which is either depression or anxiety. 20% struggle with an obsessive compulsive disorder, leaving... 10% to struggle with other disorders such as dementia, ADD, ADHD, unresolved grief, trauma, impulse control disorders, personality disorders, schizophrenia, and meet the criteria for many other disorders. Now, the fact that they don't steer away from bringing people to their homes, they realize that this isn't normal. Well, 15% do. Oh, and have what's called adequate insight and motivation. Those are the ones that I will get the call themselves and say, you know, Dr. Gerard, I'm, I'm frustrated with living this way. I want people over. I want to live a life that has open spaces in my life and in my home. 12% have what's called fluctuating insight and motivation, where they may start to declutter their home, but the underlying disorder comes up to the surface, maybe some unresolved issues have been avoided, that's why the clutter is there. So the person is unable to follow through where the motivation might have started. And 73% of those don't have any insight at all. They have no insight and no motivation. Their thinking is, I don't have a problem. My only problem is that you're in my face telling me I have a problem. 
But still, they must know. Maybe it's a denial thing. Could be. Because they must know the fact that they do usually keep to themselves and they don't have people inside. and So that looks to me like it's more of a denial thing, you know, mm-hmm. that, that we don't want to recognize the fact that we do have a problem mm-hmm. and, you know, you have a problem, that you think I have a problem or something, mm-hmm. you know. That's very true. And what you're talking about is called avoidance conditioning. So one of the components of this disorder is that its behavior is being rewarded and that behavior is rewarded positively or negatively. A positive reward is also called a positive reinforcement. And any time you reward any kind of behavior, positively or negatively, you're going to continue to see that behavior. So if anyone's ever gone on a sale or was given something where they felt that dopamine rush to the frontal lobe of I won, I got over, or a bargain, you know what that positive reinforcement feels like. You're going to keep shopping for the better deals and look for the diamonds in the rough. For people who are negatively reinforced, that is being reinforced for avoiding something else. So if I am not ready to deal with my mother's death, then I'm going to keep everything that represented my mother in my house. And I might even shop for things that my mother would have liked because I'm avoiding dealing with her death. So when you reward yourself over and over again, call it denial or call it reinforcement of of this type of behavior, you get what's called avoidance conditioning. I'm just teaching myself to avoid things and therefore the clutter builds. Well, I don't want to get off the mark, but something you said makes me think when someone does deal with a death, I'm sure that there are times when they can't bring themselves to rid of those possessions that that person had. Mm -hmm. So is that one of the things that you guys deal with also is when, you know, they keep the room exactly the way it was Mm -hmm. and years later it's still the same way it Mm -hmm. was and they can't get rid of mom's clothes or Mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Yes, and the way that that is done in psychotherapy is with what's called exposure. So we go into the room and we talk about what's here and the feelings that are there about the items. Maybe an item is picked up and a story is told about it, and the person practices a be- what's called a behavioral experiment, letting go of that item. What I call internal clutter. So there is external clutter, the things that we see, the house is, is impacted, but there's also what I call internal clutter, the things that are cluttering up a person's life, what could be the comorbid disorder. And you really have to unpack both. You have to unpack the things that are in the house and put them away appropriately so there's space. And you also have to unpack the things that the person is holding on to internally so that it can be put properly away. Now, When someone contacts you regarding a hoarding disorder, that's not usually the individual, is it? it, Or is it a family member? Or who usually reports Mm -hmm. that there's a disorder going on or there's a hoarding problem going on? Most often I get calls from landlords, property owners, environmental code agents, firefighters, what are often called first responders, family members. But rarely do I get the call from the person themselves. Of course, that would be the best approach is if the person themselves... uh, Recognized that they had a need. Exactly, because there's insight there and there's motivation there and there's something to work with. But it's a little more difficult when I get the call from an outsider. But it's not impossible. So a lot of times it could be that code enforcement has gone in to do an inspection and they went, wow, we can't Mm -hmm. because there's only a path through this house. Mm -hmm. And many times that's what it is. It's Mm -hmm. just a path, and they just keep stacking stuff up to the ceiling, right? Mm -hmm. Very much. And you bring up a good point because that's a place where I start to assess as well is how is it that this path is clear, but there are other areas in the house that aren't? What strategies are you using to open up this space? And can we take that strategy to that corner or to that wall? Okay, right now we're talking about actual hoarding, not so much the clutter. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think the clutter is probably easier to deal with than the hoarding because the hoarding, I think, is a more personal Mm -hmm. issue to deal with. Is that right? Yes, I agree. So cognitive behavioral therapy challenges thinking, broadens perspectives, modifies behavior. And basically it teaches the organizational skills of what goes where, do you need this, when will you use it, questions that you would ask yourself in a decision-making guideline. But it is just for the external clutter. It touches a little bit on the internal clutter. But 
when the external clutter is gone and the internal clutter hasn't been dealt with, resolved, then the space just really opens up for more items to come in, not really that the issue has been resolved. So it, so it just kind of starts again. It can start again, exactly. And so the person really needs to work with a therapist in order to deal with the unresolved grief or some of the other disorders that I had mentioned before. And it's so important to have the buy-in of the person who owns the items because it, what research has found is that if the items are removed, either with the pressure on the person to remove them or the person has been pushed aside and the job has been done for them, what the researchers find is that the space fills up in half the time that it did originally. Oh, yes, because there's a reason for that space. And there's got to be something there, I think, mm-hmm. to replace, mm-hmm. you know, what's been taken from them. Yes. Right. Okay. So when someone contacts you, whether it's a landlord, so sometimes a landlord contacts you mm-hmm. or a property owner mm-hmm. contacts you and says, I have a problem with a resident. Mm-hmm. And then what? What do you do at that point? Well, what I usually do is offer free consultation to provide psychoeducation around the disorder to help the person who's calling better understand the person that they're trying to reach. And I recommend resources that are out in the area, such as Hoarders.org, which is a website that is sponsored by Peninsula Community Services, where people who are looking for services can find those that are offering them. There are also online support groups, in-person support groups, therapists in the area that the person could find through the Association of Behavioral and Cognitive Therapists. There are special professional organizers that can also uh, work with this disorder. The best approach is to come together as a team. So the best team members would be the landlord, would be definitely the person who struggles with the issue, a therapist to work with the internal clutter, professional organizer to work with the external clutter or cleaning crew, whichever the person is comfortable with, and any family and friends that are still out there who can support the person. Okay. Well, we're going we're gonna to take a short break already, but don't go away because we're talking to Dr. Dana Gerard about the hoarding disorder. So stay with us. We'll be right back. The becoming a landlord just got easier. Rental Housing Network is the resource center for rental owners and property managers. Get the latest industry updates, access online forms, notices, run credit reports, and take classes to stay current on rental responsibilities. Even list your properties online for free. Come to their networking night to meet property managers, also roofers to clean up companies every second Thursday of the month. Go to rentalhousingnetwork.com. That's rentalhousingnetwork.com. The best way to protect your housing investments. All right, we're back and I'm talking to Dr. Dana Gerard and we're talking about the hoarding disorder. And so when you have a situation where a property manager or a code enforcement person has contacted you, how do you go about contacting or do you contact the person who has the issue Mm -hmm. and try to make some kind of contact with them that, you know, because I'm sure it's really tricky to get them Mm -hmm. to accept your call Mm -hmm. or let you talk to them or gaining any kind of confidence Mm -hmm. there, you know. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And it is a touchy way of dealing with it because we have confidentiality laws. So that is the first hurdle to get around. I'm a member of the San Mateo County Hoarding Task Force and the Santa Clara County Hoarding Task Force. And that is a topic that we've both been talking about. What if a first responder or environmental code agent comes in and says that they have resources that can help this person? And how do they invite that person to access those resources? And what we have been able to come up with is to have a list of resources. So whoever is contacting the person goes in and explains the situation, why that person is there, and to provide resources that are out there. I can't go and follow up with a call because I'm not hired by those companies and because of confidentiality reasons. But the first responders can educate themselves about how to approach a person, not only doing their job, but also how to do it in such a way that they're inviting the person's motivation to come to the surface. And that usually involves motivational interviewing type of training. And the Institute on Compulsive Hoarding and Cluttering offers classes like that, and that can be found on the Mental Health Association of San Francisco's website. Well, now, if a first responder does, you know, approach the individual 
about their disorder or not their disorder, but their issue as far as the condition of their property and provides them with this information. I mean, that I would think in a lot of cases, they would just add that to the clutter <laughs> yes, you know, and not follow through because I think most of them either don't want to through denial or just not want to acknowledge the fact that they have Mm -hmm. this issue. Mm -hmm. I think it's like anything, trying to let go of anything. Mm -hmm. It takes some motivation of some kind, inner Mm -hmm. motivation, Mm -hmm. to follow through with it. Yes, definitely. For the first responder, well, let me back up a little bit. When you said the follow through, the follow through needs to come from the person who is struggling with the clutter and it needs to come from the person who has the awareness of the clutter. So if the environmental code agent provides the information, then there needs to be a follow up because, yes, I agree with you. There is a lack of follow up on the person who's struggling with the clutter and the information can just become more clutter. And it can feel very overwhelming. There are some resources out there that are helpful, but they can also be pricey. So there can be some investigative work on the person struggling with clutter. There can be some investigation work for them. But it does take follow through. And it's not as easy as clean this up or you're out 90 days. That would be like giving someone a blank piece of paper and not really giving them directions on what to do with it. Well, I think where the problem comes in is the landlord finds that they're tenant has pretty much filled the house Mm -hmm. when there's only a path. And I know that the first inclination is to give them a 90 day notice. Mm -hmm. We talked about that. But if no one has diagnosed this person, Mm -hmm. then I see that there's an additional problem there. Because of course, the first thing that the tenant's going to say is, I need more time. We understand that. But if no one's coming in and diagnosing a disorder, Then you're kind of caught between a rock and a hard spot, you know. Mm -hmm. There has to be awareness of the disorder because now that the disorder is in the DSM-5, it qualifies for reasonable accommodations under the Disability Act. So the person has more time. But still, that's not where it stops. There needs to be, as I had mentioned before, the team that comes in to support that individual. I've been on a case before similar to what we're talking about where it wasn't the landlord that had called me, but the tenant who had been given the 90 days to clear her space. Which is a good thing, because I'd rather they call than for the landlord to have to call you. Exactly. And so there's no confidentiality breaching, and I can follow up with a call. So the client called me, but it was a week before she was supposed to be evicted and was terrified. And this is what usually happens to the paralysis from the anxiety or the depression rises to the surface. So what I was able to do was invite her permission for me to contact her landlord. And once I was able to provide the landlord with some psychoeducation behind hoarding, he bought in and he agreed to be a team member. The landlord and the tenant were so upset with each other that they couldn't talk to each other. So I worked with both of them on conflict resolution communication. Still, what they came to a place of is that the landlord would check in with me weekly to see how the client was doing, and he would be able to observe how the client was doing at the facility. What progress. Exactly. And this occurred weekly for about two months. But before we could even do that, the landlord and the tenant had to agree that she did get an extension of time. And that it had to have these specific specifications. She had to work with me. I had to give updates to her landlord. The landlord was able to observe her progress. And we would bring in other team members to support her. And what happened was that within those two months, with all those resources, she was able to clear space in her home. And the landlord was able to help her stay in the home because he was such an effective team member. And the rental contract was rewritten in such a way that the landlord would give the tenant 24 hours notice monthly to come in and do inspections in her apartment to make sure that she maintained her progress, which is something that is often not realized has to be done. That once the clear out is done and the person is in therapy, or maybe the person has even stopped therapy, that that's not where the progress continues. Yeah, it tends to, to end at that point because there's nobody coming in, causing what would be called a visitor effect. There's no one checking up on the person, and the clutter can return. And so there is a whole maintenance program that needs to be done even after the decluttering has occurred. Maybe support groups, family members, 
treating the house like a house instead of a warehouse is a big impact for making continued progress. So it's not a one-time wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. I'm glad we got that done. We don't have to deal with that anymore. There's a whole series of progress for maintaining, well, a whole series of process to maintain the progress. You know, you said something to me that made me have this flash. Mm -hmm. You said that the resident contacted you like a week before they're supposed to be out, which doesn't surprise me at all. Again, this is the, like the denial thing, and they just like hope the problem goes away because mm-hmm. they don't really want to move, and they certainly can't let go of these possessions. Yeah. And so they wait until they're pushed to that point mm-hmm. that they have to contact somebody mm-hmm. in order to prevent being, you know, evicted. Mm-hmm. And, and somebody has to diagnose this as a yeah. as a disorder. So. Where I'm going with this is Mm -hmm. that I think that the more education that housing providers have on Mm -hmm. this issue Mm -hmm. is really important because what they could do is, you know, when they give that 90-day notice, they could also be giving that resident information Mm -hmm. on who to contact regarding the issue with their clutter or their hoarding And if they did it in the very beginning, Mm -hmm. it might cause the person to contact Mm -hmm. the right task force early on, Mm -hmm. and maybe they could address it earlier. Mm -hmm. But I really encourage housing providers to work with Mm -hmm. the team Mm -hmm. and and become a team member so Mm -hmm. that you can work through it. Because many times it's not because you really want the the tenant it's not personal you don't it's not that you want the tenant to go but you do want to make sure that you have a clean and safe environment Mm -hmm. and if there are boxes blocking every window and you know i know that there's been situations where you know like people had to climb over stuff to get in the front door Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. and can become that extreme Mm -hmm. so i think that it's really important for landlords and just for anyone listening dana is going to teach a class for us and so check our website for when her class is coming up and get on board really early. Yes, definitely. And threats don't work. Arguments don't work. What works I is think being, that's probably counterproductive. It very much is because people, anyone who feels threatened yeah. or attacked will naturally defend. And the same is true for someone who's struggling with hoarding. So Dr. Tompkins is a wonderful author of many books on hoarding, and he has a clinic in Berkeley. And he wrote a book called Digging Out, and it's all about creating that team of support around the person who is struggling with the issue. And he has a great acronym for inviting people who are struggling with clutter, inviting them to the team themselves. And that acronym is LEAP, L-E-A-P. And the L is for listen, because the person is their own best consultant. And really, you're inviting the person who's struggling with cluttering to help you help them. So you want to listen to what is effective for them, what's motivating for them. Then you want to empathize. Imagine if you had something so precious and so life-sustaining that it just seemed to hold your whole structure together. And I come in and tell you, you can't have it. Just notice what that feels like in your body. And it's the same for everything that's in that house, regardless of whether it has value or not to an outsider. Then you want to A, affirm, find some common ground to stand on. What I usually like to do is ask the client, what would you like to do more, better, easier in your home that you're not able to do right now? And let's make that the goal. Let's partner to make that the goal. Not the whole house, but maybe the bed to sleep in or the bathroom to take a shower in or the kitchen to cook in safely. Mm -hmm. And P, you partner. You work toward that that, uh, common goal, finding the resources, practicing with the person, what's called exposure, having things and then not having things so that the discomfort of letting go becomes comfortable. Well, I think everybody has a problem with letting go of some things to a certain degree. You know, I mean, I know that I clean out my closets like twice a year and Mm -hmm. I have to go. I didn't even know I had this. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I don't need it, you know, Mm -hmm. but it is a letting go process. It is a letting go process. And to do it repeatedly is to strengthen that muscle so that you can let go. There is 
in cognitive behavioral therapy for treating hoarding, there is what's called a decision-making guideline. So questions that you would ask yourself when you're picking up items to let them go. Do I need this? Did I borrow this? Who can I give this to? Maybe there was an intention of a gift, but it was never given to the person, so there's follow-through there. Will I repair this? Can I sell this? And all these questions that you ask yourself. I recommend having 10 of these questions, but a lot of times what I find working with this population is that it usually comes down to maybe one or three questions that they can ask themselves and then make a quick decision. Okay, well, we're running out of time. I told you it goes quick. (laughs) If someone wants to contact you, Mm -hmm. how would they do that? Well, I can be reached on my website, drdanagerard.com, or by phone, which is 650-898-4549. Okay. Thank you for being with us today. Next week on our show, we're going to have Jason Pintar, who's going to be talking about estate planning and avoiding probate. Thanks for being with us. To get more information or to become a member of Rental Housing Network, visit our website at rentalhousingnetwork.com. And don't forget to like us on Facebook. 